Thank you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, band. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday. If you are watching Facebook Live, hit that share button. If you are watching the tube, YouTube, uh, subscribe. Uh, today I am closing out our series on the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. These past seven weeks have been challenging and convicting. The Sermon on the Mount is not a collection of rules or rituals. Jesus is after our hearts. He, he's after our mind, our will, and emotions. He makes it crystal clear self-sufficiency is impossible because his standards are higher than we ever thought and our disobedience is greater than we ever realized. The Sermon on the Mount is not a goal that you and I can accomplish. It's a wall that we crash into and realize Jesus is our only hope. And Jesus concludes his Sermon on the Mount with a parable. An earthly story with a spiritual lesson found in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. We just sung about it. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. In other words, the person who walks by faith in obedience to God in his word is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus is the rock, not Dwayne Johnson. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, sinking sand. He said, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Most of us at some point in life will feel overlooked because someone else had more education, more influence, power, or resources. That's life. It happens. But faith is the great equalizer. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, listen, Do not think of yourself, do not think of selfie more highly than you ought, than you should. Oh my dang, good God. I could camp on those 10 words for 10 weeks. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. God gives all, someone say all, all all of us the same amount of faith and opportunity to play our part in his purpose on earth. Paul said to think of yourself with sober judgment. Being sober is opposite of being drunk. The opposite of being intoxicated, bashed, hammered, stoned, wasted by an outside influence. But sometimes, sometimes being intoxicated is more than what you drink, smoke, swallow, or shoot. Sometimes it's what you think. Let's press in. Some of you are so intoxicated by the pain of a past failure, you cannot move forward into the future God has for you. You cannot change the past. It's impossible. But you can learn from it. There's a reason the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror. Because what's in front of you is more important than what's behind you. I don't know what you did last year, last month, last week, or last night. Glad you're here. But I do know this. The God of this book uses people in spite of their failure. God uses broken people because only broken people exist. God is a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Don't let yesterday's failure control the future God has for you. Some of you are intoxicated with a stronghold, a secret sin. 
An addiction that's keeping you from experiencing God's best. Some of you have been set free. You've experienced salvation. You've experienced God's forgiveness and grace and mercy. But you are not living free. You are trying to hold on to some of that old life. When our desires cross over God's word, it's not 50 shades of gray. It's sin. Some of you are one step away from stepping into stupid. I promise the pleasure of sin will always under-deliver. Is it fun? Yes. Can it be exhilarating? Yes. But in the end, it leads to death. And it could be the death of a marriage, a friendship, a relationship, a testimony. Satan wants you to think it's okay to dabble with the old life. It's it's okay to click on it, to watch it. It's harmless. It's just a text. It's just a PM. You, You deserve the power, possessions, and pleasures of this life. YOLO. That's what the devil wants you to believe. You earned it. So keep that struggle a secret. Wear a mask. Hide the pain. But God says just the opposite in James chapter 5, verse 16. He said, make this your common practice. Do it often. Confess your sins to each other. To those you are living in community with. It's why community is so important. And then it says to pray for each other. Now this is where a lot of Christians struggle. Instead of praying, we post. We gossip, we talk, we judge. Confess your sins to each other and pray for, pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. Satan wants you to live in the shadows of your stronghold. But God says if you will drag that secret sin out of the darkness and, and into the light and confess it, He will bring healing and wholeness. Newsflash, you don't fall into sin. You might fall into a hole if you're mowing the grass. You might fall into a hole if you're smoking grass. Probably will. All temptation is common for every person. Tara just got it. (laughs) All temptation is common for every person. It's not just you. The gospel according to Satan hasn't changed. It's the same since the beginning. The same thing he did with Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Did God really say? Stop trying to put a comma where God put a period. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, common to every person, and God is faithful. Say, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, watch this, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. God says with every temptation, He will provide an escape route, an exit door. Hey, over here, this is your escape. Some of you need to get out of your own head. And I'm not discounting your temptation or struggle. I get it. It's real. But there's there's people three rows in front of you and behind you who are dealing with the same struggle and the same temptation, but they chose not to be a victim. They chose to believe that generational curses were one on the cross. Stop saying my grandpa did it, my daddy did it, so I'm going to do it. No, Jesus beat generational curses on the cross. It's time to experience the abundant life God has for you. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The big C, the church as a whole, is Filled with Christians intoxicated with a lack of faith. A fear to live out the calling God has for their lives. If you have a phone, I want you to hold it up. Come on, everyone hold your phone up. I know everyone has one. Now, turn on your camera. 
and look at yourself. <laughs> this should come natural for a lot of you. I've seen your social media, okay? A lot of selfies. Look at selfie and tell selfie, sober up. Sober up. And stop letting outside influences affect my faith. Yeah. I like when you listen. Not one person can say to God, you didn't give me enough faith. No one can. Because all of us have been given the same measure of faith. But there's a big difference between having something and using it. Faith is like a muscle. The more you work it, right? Oh, that's heavy. The more you work it, flex it, stretch it, the more strength, mass, and girth you will gain. I like that word, girth. But if you don't exercise your muscles, what happens? Fatigue sets in. Atrophy sets in. When I was in my 20s, I used to do bench press competitions. I was prideful. And I'd like to tell you that was pre-Jesus, but it wasn't. <laughs> Anyways, part of my training to gain strength was to do a lot of reps and rest. Reps and rest. It's the same with our faith muscle. It needs reps, steps of faith to grow. God, I hear you. That doesn't make sense. I don't understand, but I trust you. Our faith muscle needs reps, and it needs rest. It needs God's presence. It needs solitude. In Psalms 46, God said, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. Be what? Still. Now, if that's true, and I believe it is, or I wouldn't be up here preaching, be still and, and know that I am God. If that's true, then the opposite must be true as well. That if we are not still, if we're always going, always hustling, we can't know who God is. Yeah. All biceps are created equal. But not all biceps look like Officer Daniel Corbett's. <laughs> look at those biceps. He doesn't know I'm doing this. <laughs> Hashtag beast mode. Those biceps are a product of a lot of training. It's the same with our faith. The more reps of weight our faith has to pick up and carry, the bigger our faith becomes. And the bigger our faith becomes, we realize Jesus is our steady rock. He is our firm foundation. True faith is finding our part in God's purpose on planet Earth. And yes, God has a purpose for your life and your life and your life and your life and your life watching online. If you're watching now, God has a purpose for your life. If you're watching six months from now, God has a purpose for your life. And I say that because some of God's people struggle to believe God has a purpose for their life. And I get it. For some people, it's easier to be paralyzed by fear, to give up, to give in, to to tap out rather than move forward in faith. Listen, if you are under the sound of my voice and still breathing, pulse check, you have un unfinished God assignments. God's not finished with you. He has more work for you to do. Well, how would I know when God is finished? You'll know. Faith is not logical. In fact, it defies logic. Romans 5 says we are justified in Christ through what? Faith. What is justification? It's a right standing with God because of our intellect, our talent, our works. No, it's faith. Faith levels the playing field. It's for every person. It's why the Bible says unless you have childlike faith, you will never see the kingdom of God. If you want a Ph.D. in faith, spend time with your children or grandchildren. And by the way, I don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but I now have another grandchild. Ellie Rose. Oh. 
Looks just like Papa D. <laughs> Our children and grandchildren believe and trust what they are exposed to. Do they have questions? Absolutely. Why Papa D? Why Papa D? Why Papa D? But they believe what they hear, what they see, and what they are exposed to. I find it funny how some people with their small minds that God created have the audacity to put thoughts into an argument that he doesn't exist. Wow. Yeah. You maybe have 1% of all knowledge, but you can figure it out. Faith is a gift. We receive it from God through the Holy Spirit. But it's our responsibility to grow our faith muscle. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 17, faith without works is dead, non-existent, not breathing. We don't work for salvation. We work from salvation. We don't work for victory. We work from victory. Following Jesus will produce fruit. Following Jesus will produce evidence. Now, I'm a recovering legalist. Hello, my name is Daryl. Thank you. We're in therapy together, me and Pastor Shannon. So I used to have the checklist. Read my Bible, check. Pray, check. Listen to worship music, check. Buy someone coffee in the Starbucks drive-thru, check. Go to church, check. Shout amen, check. Shout amen again, check, check. I didn't want my faith to be dead. But that's rule following. It's religion. Real faith is about a relationship with Jesus. Listen, the moment I was justified as an 18-year-old boy, a root system of faith was planted deep inside my heart and soul. The Bible says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's all about that faith. As Christians, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to talk by faith, walk by faith, live by faith, pray by faith, move by faith, believe by faith, stand by faith, and work by faith. Faith empowers us by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If faith is the substance of things we hope for, and the evidence of things not seen, then our faith must be demonstrated. The biblical word is obedience. It's called faith in action. But if you have to see it before being obedient, it cancels out our faith. Faith goes before seeing, or it's not faith. Faith is not something you say or feel. It's God, I trust you, even when I don't understand. I trust you when life doesn't make sense. I trust you when this scripture doesn't make sense. That's faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, it is impossible. Let that sink in. Not possible, but impossible to please God without what? Faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Some of you today have lost hope. And your faith muscle is weak. It's weak. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For some of you, church is just a routine. It's a ritual. It's a check the box. You don't come to feed your faith. You come to check a box. So all you hear is want, 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 want. And you're thinking, I wish you would hurry up because I'm hungry. It's why your faith is weak. It's why you constantly struggle. But some of you today are involved in a spiritual fight, a spiritual warfare. And you came to feed your faith. 
to move forward into God's future. If that's you, I want to encourage you. When your faith intersects with the God of the impossible, impossible situations become possible. I'm going to say that again. When your faith intersects with the God of the impossible, impossible situations become possible. But our faith, listen up, don't miss this part, but our faith must always submit to the sovereignty of God. Must always submit to the sovereignty of God. We are part of his story that's being written in real time. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about our kingdom. It's about his. And sometimes our calling is to wrestle with conflict. God never promised comfortable. He said in this world you will have trouble. Opposition is not always an obstacle to run from. It's an opportunity to plug into God's power and become more like Christ. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus wrestled with the conflict of the cross or the comforts of another way. If you know the story, you know that it was intense. He was praying to his father, and the Bible says that there were drops of sweat that became blood. What a prayer. How intense. And he asked the father, if there's any other way, this cup of suffering, is there any other way? But then Jesus said, what, not my will, but your will be done. Sometimes God will allow conflict in our lives to remind us that he's in control. God never said, I'll never give you more than you can handle. God never said that. That's not in here. That's called really, really bad Facebook theology. Can I get a Baptist amen? A Catholic cough. A Pentecostal hallelujah. Jesus had an appointment with death to offer us eternal life. Salvation is a posture of faith in Jesus that begins in a moment but persists for a lifetime. God's grace is not only saving grace, it's also sustaining grace. Opposition is not the absence of God's presence. It's an opportunity to lean in and trust Him with the conflict or the circumstances of life. Has your faith become so weak, it's corroded your confidence to trust God or hear His voice? Some of you have been splashing around in the shallow end of the pool with your faith for too long. God is calling you into deeper water. He's calling you to walk by faith and trust Him. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. On and on, the book of Hebrews says, by faith, by faith, by faith. Kingdoms were conquered. Nations destroyed. By faith, women gave birth after their wombs were shut up. By faith. Faith and obedience will not always make sense. Joshua walking around the walls of Jericho didn't make sense until it did. Moses holding up his staff in front of the Red Sea didn't make sense until it did. The fiery furnace didn't make sense until it did. Jesus dying on the cross didn't make sense until it did. Faith. Faith. God wants you to trust Him and live out this calling that He has on your life. It's greater than you can ever imagine. He never promised easy. But He promised, I will be with you always to the end, to the last breath. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways. Not some, not most. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And He will make your paths straight. I don't know about you, but I need a faith that jump starts my Monday. I need a faith that helps me overcome temptation on Tuesday. I need a faith that goes to work with me on Wednesday. I need a faith that shows up in traffic on Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I need a faith that helps me share my testimony with my neighbor on Saturday. 
I skipped Friday. I need a faith that helps me share my testimony on, on, with my neighbor on Saturday, but I need a faith that helps me fight off the devil on Friday when my cronies want to go to the club. Yeah. Devil wanted me to skip that one. I need a faith that wakes me up on Sunday, excited to be in God's house with God's people, worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Faith is more than an access card in a crisis or a cool post on social media. Faith is functional in all the ups and downs of life, not just the special occasions, not just when you need him. Jesus is more than the footing or the infrastructure of our faith. He is the object of our faith. He is our firm foundation and everything else is sinking sand. Embracing faith. It's not always easy. Embracing God's plan for our lives is not always easy. Being faithful when no one else is watching isn't sexy. But it's better than FOMO. The fear of missing out God using you to build his kingdom instead of yours. Don't miss out. God is looking for a commitment of faith that goes beyond our personal convenience. This might be shocking for some of you. But the Bible says in James chapter 1, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Every pain has a purpose, including your past failure. Don't let it hold you hostage. Don't do it. Paul said, I forget what's behind me and I reach toward what's ahead of me. High five two people and tell them, I'm reaching forward into God's future. I'm reaching forward into God's future. Forgetting what's behind me. I close with this and we're done. John 6, Jesus declared, this is what faith looks like to follow me. And the Bible says many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Go read it. This is what it looks like to follow me. This is what it will cost you. And the Bible says many turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. I want every person to stand to your feet. As our worship team closes out today's experience, this is your opportunity to make this front an altar and maybe just pray because you, you want to re-energize your faith and say, God, I, I, I've been running from you. I, I've been prodigal living, but I'm done. I'm turning back towards you. I'm going to grow my faith. And I'm going to live for you for every breath that I have in my body. God, we love you. Have your way. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.